Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is still doing well, and welcome to this kind of sneak in bonus on a Saturday, just to get us a little closer to Saturday Nightmares, live from New York. Before we get into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It does not cost you a cent. Click the like button. Takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads that I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all of these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump into this kind of sneaky little bonus, shall we? So I had received an email um, saying dad is number one fan. And I was like, that's kind of interesting. So I immediately read that one first. Um, and the gentleman that reached out to me, his name was Micah, and his dad is named James, just like my dad. And um, apparently James uh, has listened to the channel for a while now, and he's, he's disabled. Uh, he was a park ranger in the 90s. Um, and then... Because of his job is is physically disabled, mentally disabled too, um, and we'll get into that. But he listens to my channel and a couple other channels. He listens to Dark Waters. Um, he had never heard of Dark Waters until I was talking about him, and which is crazy because James's channel is huge compared to mine, but. He wanted to reach out because, well, I'll share the email and then we'll get into the experience because it is absolutely horrific. It takes place in an Idaho National Park called Crater of the Moon. And um, <sighs> there's a lot, a lot of strange things surrounding that area, including a defunct government facility. So, Jeff, my dad was a park ranger at Crater of the Moon in Idaho from 1972 to 1992. He shared this with us in 1990 when I was 24 and my sister was 20, days after the event had happened. He also had similar events, but nothing so shocking as the first on September 2nd, 1990. He listens to your channel and a few others similar to yours, but he loves two guests, Phil, the hunting guide from Idaho and Montana, and Bill from Walla Walla, Washington, the rancher. And because of these two guests, he wanted to share his experience with you. He has been in poor health since 1992. He was forced to retire due to having an aneurysm, which my sister and I believe it is because of what he saw and maybe the power around it. September 2nd, 1990, started out like every other day. He got up for work. I was just divorced, so I was still now living with my parents. With my folks at the time. This is hard for me to type out. Can you give me a call? My name is Micah, and my dad is James, just like yours. So I give Micah a call. I text him first and give him a call, letting him know, hey, uh, this is Jeff Nadalny. 
are you free? I'd like to talk with you and your dad, if possible. And <clears throat> no more than did I send the text is my phone ringing. And it was Micah. And he was very excited. Uh, he was sitting with his dad. He, he lives with his dad still. Um, his mom has since passed. But he takes care of his dad. His dad has had four aneurysms since 1992 and he believes him and his sister believe that it is because of what he experienced at um craters of the moon in idaho and the surrounding um facilities in that area he also thinks that quite possibly one the one facility that i'm going to mention has a heck of a lot to do with what his dad saw and what happened to his um, physicality and such. But I'm gonna, I wasn't really familiar with the area, so I'm gonna familiarize you guys with the surrounding area and what is there. Um, Craters of the Moon within Idaho is in south central central idaho midway between boise and yellowstone national park the lava field reaches southeastward from pioneer mountains combined usa highway 20 26 and 93 cuts through the northwestern part of the monument and provides access to it however the rugged landscape of the monument itself remains remote and undeveloped with only one paved road across the northern end so it is not like any other national parks where you can just drive through you have to get out of your vehicle you have to go hiking um, there is over 700 cave slash lava tubes that are in this area and the majority of them are not allowed access, public access. Uh, the crater of the moon lava field spreads 618 square miles and is lar the largest, mostly Holocene-aged uh, lava field in the United States, minus Hawaii. Uh, the monument and preserve contain more than 25 lava, lava cones, uh, of volcanic cones, excuse me, including outstanding examples of splatter cones. The 60 distinct lava flows from the form that form the craters of the moon lava field range in ages from 15,000 to 2,000 years in age. Uh, the King's Bowl and Wapi lava fields both are about 2,200 years old and are part of the preserve. The lava field is the largest of several lava beds of lava that erupted from 53 mile southeast to northwest trending Great Rift Volcanic Zone, a line of weakness in the Earth's crust. Together, the fields from other fissures, they make up lava beds in Idaho, which in most turn, in most turn are in the much larger Snake River Plain Volcano Province. The Great Rift extends across the entire Snake River Plain. Um, elevation is 5,910 feet above sea level. And there's, I've got some other just basic uh, information, but you know, like rain and stuff. Now, so we are dealing with a, uh, I believe that caldera, I was looking at a map, that caldera could be connected to the Yellowstone um, caldera. It's quite possible. If you look at a map to where this is and where it extends into, it's pretty, pretty incredible. Now, the government has a really strange 
uh, or, or puts really strange and deadly things near our national parks. And we often wonder why we have so many missing people there. Well, I really am starting to think that it's our government and what they do uh, with experimentation and things they shouldn't. Now, uh, roughly, there's a, a location, a decommissioned research reactor called EBR-1 or Experimental Breeder Reactor. Now, this map right here, EBR-1 is here. The Craters of the Moon is here. That is the only route to get to it uh, via road. But, I mean, the toxins and stuff. So what is this place? Well, it's a decommissioned research reactor, the United States National Historic Landmark, located in the desert about 18 miles southeast of Arco, uh, Idaho. It is the world's first breeder reactor at 1:50 p.m. on December 20th, 1951, it became one of the one of the world's first electricity generating nuclear power plants when it produced sufficient electricity to illuminate four 200 watt light bulbs. EBR1 generated sufficient elect electricity to power its building and continued to be used for experimental purposes until it was decommissioned in 64. The museum is open for visitors from late May up until September. He had his incident occurred in September 2nd, which is strange. I didn't put that together until just now. Uh, as a part, the National Reactor Testing Station, uh, since 2005, Idaho National Laboratory, EBR-1's construction started in 49. The reactor was designed and constructed by a team led by Walter Zinn at the Argonne National Laboratory, Idaho site. Um, in its earlier stages, was referred to as Chicago Pile 4 or CP4 and Zinn's Infernal Pile, Infernal, Infernal pile installation of the reactor um took place in 51 da 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 and began powering in august 24th of 1951 on december 20th of that year it produced electricity for the first time and um it talks a little bit about the how and stuff, uh, what they did. Now, this I found interesting is we all know that there is a lot of strange stuff happening in Tennessee. And uh, I've talked about this. The world's first electricity produced by a nuclear reactor occurred during an experiment three years earlier in September of 48 at X10 Graphite Reactor at Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee. Later in 55, another nuclear milestone was reached when experimental boiling water reactor plant called Borox 3 um, in Argonne National Laboratory was connected to external loads, powering a nearby city of Arco, which is right there. It is, Arco is 18 miles from uh, EBR-1, and it is one of the closest cities uh, to craters of the moon. Now, I wanted, to, I wanted to see exactly what this place was more about. And we talk a lot on this channel about other things. You know, um, we talk about CERN, we talk about HARP, we talk just a lot about a lot. The Hadron Collider creating portals. This kind of creeped me out because how did EBR-1 work? The plutonium-235 
239 is bombarded with high-speed neutrons. When the plutonium nucleus absorbs one such free neutron, it splits into two fission uh, fragments. This fission releases heat as well as the neutrons, which in turn split other plutonium nuclei, freeing still more neutrons. So they are just slamming uh, this plutonium with high-speed neutrons. Sounds pretty much similar to what they're doing at the Hadron Collider, just slamming uh, <laughs> dangerous things that humans shouldn't be playing with and creating things that we shouldn't, or not even creating, opening things that we shouldn't even be looking or messing with. Anyway, I just wanted to give you a kind of what this area is about. So now you can see there's an old volcanic, um, old volcanic activity. You know, 2,000 years ago, some of the first settlers on this, in this country, Native American, what, whatever, probably stumbled upon an active lava field, you know? Um, it's pretty insane. And then you've got this really dangerous nuclear reactor, breeding reactor. So now that you're familiar with the area um, and uh, Micah kind of introduced himself to me, um, I was able to speak with James um, very briefly. Like I said, he has had four brain aneurysms. It affects his uh, speech quite a bit and his mobility. He does walk, but very, uh, very diff with very with a lot of difficulty. Um, but what what I was able to talk with him, or what I got from him, was he was a really nice guy. So. September 2nd, he is on duty and it's a normal day, a normal day like any other day. Um, there had been some uh, scientific people in that area dealing with a lot of the bats that were um, using these lava tubes and caves as homes and supposedly... That's one of the big reasons why these caves are not accessible to the public right now. Now, he had probably noticed that there were almost 100 people at the monument that day total um, in the sign out or sign in and out sheets. Now, he started to go and do his patrols. Um, he is approached by two hikers that were hiking by the North Crater, uh, south of the Paisley Cone. And they, what they saw from a distance, what they um, told him, we saw two wolves, but they were acting very strange. Uh, they seemed to be upright. They almost looked like werewolves. And the lady, the lady that was man and woman, the lady said that that's what they were. She goes, they were werewolves, honey. They were werewolves. They weren't wolves. Uh, James kind of says, okay, um, you know, we don't really have any wolves in this area, uh, to my knowledge. And they don't really move bipedally. <laughs> I'm going to go check it out. So he starts to make his way there and he gets to this section. Um, he gets past the Paisley Cone and there's some place called the Natural Bridge. He's almost by there and there's a tunnel, a lava tube tunnel. It's pretty deep. Um, and large in diameter it's a, it's a large kind of not cave because you can go right through it 
he sees these two wolves that he's looking at them from a distance and he can see that they are now quadruped. They are not bipedal, but they are running towards this uh, Indian tunnel. And that's the name of this lava tube. Um, and it is accessible to the public still to this day, which is freaking scary. Now, he starts to walk that way a little bit. He is armed with, he has a Ruger Security 6, which is chambered in 357. Um, he's making his way there. And as he gets about 50 to 75 feet away, he watches these things enter. And he's like, are they going to the other side? All of a sudden, he hears this kind of rumble, feels this rumble, hears this rumble. Um, it was like a really loud thunder, but he could feel the ground kind of move, almost like an earthquake. And he's looking around and he looks back in the tube and he sees this bluish white light kind of erupt from the middle of this Indian tunnel uh, where these dogmen had just entered. And within a second, it's over. The light is over. The noise is over. And he looks and they're not there. And he's like, what the hell? They were just there. I know they were just there. What the hell was that light? What the hell is that noise? Now, think about what I was just talking about with EBR1. So he's now freaked out. He's not thinking about EBR1 or any kind of government facility in the area. He's like, what the hell just happened? You know, there's been numerous UFO reports. Um, and other kind of strange anomalies in the area, but nothing, nothing like what he just witnessed. Um, James starts to walk into this tunnel and it's old lava, you know, just an old lava tube, uh, desert, it's desert area. Uh, there's shrub, shrubbery and not like a forest. Um, he walks into the tunnel and he's looking around. He's got his flashlight with him. He's got his hand on his revolver and he doesn't see anything. He can't see any foot footprints because there's not going to be because it's lava. It's, you know, old dried lava, um, pretty much almost obsidian. It's jet black. Um, so he gets to the middle. He's looking on the sides doesn't see anything and he gets to the other side and he's now in the open. He's in the open air. Um, so he's just looking around like, where the hell did these things go? Now he's got some sand and uh, like silica or whatever it's called on the ground. He's looking for prints. He can't see any prints. There's not even human prints there. So he's like, no one had been through here. Those things didn't go through here. What the hell was that light? What the hell are those things? What was that noise that I just heard? And he's turning, looking, um, probably no more than two to three minutes does that same rumbling noise occur. Uh, and then he's looking around and he looks back into the cave because when he heard that rumble, he knew instinctively and what he just witnessed, look in the cave. I'm not going in there. He started to back away from the cave uh, out of instinct. You know, you see two dog men walk in, you hear a rumble and a bluish white light and now they're gone. And now that rumbling's coming back. What do you think's coming out? The dog men? That's what he's thinking. So he's backing up. As he backs up, he stops and 
he starts to notice that something is coming out of that bluish white light. Within the next 30 to 45 seconds, he sees a humanoid figure walking out of that light. It is still in the um, middle of the Indian tunnel. He's standing in daylight. <clears throat> Probably 30, 40 feet away from the entrance of the tunnel. And he's watching this figure another 30 feet, 40 feet. So he's a good 80 to 100 feet away from it. And he sees this human figure walk out of this bluish white light. And he's like, what the hell is going on? He's at first thought it was going to be these two dogmen that he had just seen disappear in front of him with like 10 minutes. Uh, he describes this man as wearing some kind of like almost like a loincloth. Um, it resembled shorts, but kind of like a loincloth. He had some kind of shirt thing that was like similar to uh, a tank top, but made out of what looked to be animal hide or leather. And at first glance, he's thinking this thing is his size. But as he's staring at it, and this thing is now staring at him, and James has his hand on his Ruger Security 6, ready in case this thing comes out and and charges him because he realizes holy shit this thing is got to be somewhere between 10 and 12 feet and he's looking using different um heights of the the cave different you know little sections of the cave to get a somewhat accurate measurement of this thing and <clears throat> Lo and behold, at the end of all this, he gets a better, better uh, guesstimate of its height to be somewhere around 15 feet in height altogether. Um, it walks almost to the edge of the entrance to the tunnel. This is in a cave because now the light has gone this rumbling again has stopped and he can see through the tunnel he can see through this tube he can see the other side where he just was um and now he has his pistol drawn and ready to fire but he's waiting for this thing to charge him because he doesn't want to shoot a human because in his mind, he's thinking, this is a human. How do I go about shooting this thing? You know, well, it's this far away from me. It's still 40 feet away from me. It's standing at the edge of the, the thing. Um, it throws this kind of like rock device at him. It, it It's not. A rock and it's not just like you know it's actually like a sharpened tool and this giant I guess you'd call it has this kind of like leather like slingshot thing and he just launches it at James and it hits the side of the where he's at this like lava structure thing and smashes that's when he now he's being attacked he's like holy shit you know that just smashed this cone this tube of you know old lava that you can't smash like i couldn't smash it he couldn't smash it he, the force to smash this it's almost obsidian that's that's 
where obsidian comes from is massive amounts of pressure, volcanic glass. And it just, whatever he threw just shatters both the, the tool or weapon and this lava tube thing. He shoots two rounds, 357, 40 feet away. He sees one shot hit this giant in the stomach area, and he missed the other shot. Uh, he said, you know, he was trembling. I I'm surprised I even hit it with one, you know. Um, and, and shooting a 357, 40 feet accurately under that kind of conditions is not easy it's it's easier said than done and i'm sure there's going to be those gun guys i shoot that every day brad who i know shoots on a daily basis or semi-daily basis he even talked to me about how difficult it is under conditions to fire a 357 accurately especially at a distance um it gets hit and it it makes this bellow. Uh and he's now expecting it to fully charge him, but for some reason it cannot cross over the cave or tube wall. You know, the there's like an invisible wall. That's the best way he can describe it, as he was describing to Micah and his sister and his wife. Because after this, on September 3rd. He never told a coworker or anyone else about this experience. He kept it to himself, his kids and his wife. That's it. Um, seconds later, there's this rumbling noise and this blue white light erupts and this giant kind of steps back and st is staring at him. Um, it's not holding his wound. He's bleeding. He can see there is a, a color coming, you know, like its skin color was darker, uh, the darker than my skin color. It was darker, you know, a darker, uh, the way Micah, the way James explained it to, to Micah, his sister and his wife, um, back then was it was, its skin was dark skinned like a Native American, um, not like a black man, but darker than a, a, a Caucasian. Um, it just turns and walks into this light and is gone. Just the light vanishes, the rumbling stops. He's sitting there catching his breath, trying to figure out, you know, he's got to walk ahead of him because there's no roads through this park you there's like roads that you walk um it, it's not like like i said it's not like yellowstone where you got the trucks and you're driving and you know he the 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 park rangers there really have a different kind of job like camping is there's no open fires um and, and such so he knows now he's got about a 45 minute to an hour walk back to where he his vehicle is parked um back to where somewhat of a civilized area is and he now knows that he is not getting back he sat outside of this cave for a half an hour uh trying to go over what he just saw and now he's like it's getting dark i can either go around this tube and you know have a two and a half hour walk back to my truck or i can go through indian tunnel again and shave almost two hours off because it's he's got to go up the mountain up and it's going to be a dangerous 
uh, a dangerous hike back the, the way he have to, to avoid going through the tunnel. He goes through the tunnel and as he's walking through, he starts to look at where this thing was. He's very, very scared, just, you know, emotionally drained and hand on his revolver. It's probably out. I mean, it'd be out for me, but he's looking and he sees this one ridge to where he remembered this giant to be standing next to and the the ridge where it was, he stood next to it. Him being an average height, 5'11", six foot, put his arm up and his arm extends, what, a foot and a half, two feet. So that'd bring it about eight feet. And he knew that there was another seven feet above that to where his head would have been. That's when he realized, holy shit, this thing was not a human. It was n not anything that you know, it is supposed to exist on Earth as we know it. Um, Native Americans in the area and, you know, Montana, Idaho, Nevada, New Mexico all talk about giants ranging in between 12 to 15 feet in height. Sometimes I believe, um, I think in Iowa or Ohio, Ohio, there was like an 18 foot skeleton of a giant found. I know there's been some in Eastern or Western New York too, ranging around that same 15 foot mark. So he gets out of the tunnel, nothing happens and he goes home. Um, he shares with his wife first and Micah is, is living with his mom and dad, just freshly divorced. So he then tells Micah what happened because he's 24 years old. You know, he's not a kid. Um, Micah goes, you know, when dad told me that, he goes, I immediately called my sister and said, I think dad lost his mind, you know, and, and he told Mike or Micah told his sister and uh, a day later, his sister was there and, you know, said, Dad, tell me, tell me what happened. You know, I want to hear the story. Tell me. Um, and he proceeded to tell her. Now, he has had other experiences like Micah had stated. But after that experience, <clears throat> he started to notice that he was getting migraines and um, something that he never had before. He was not a sickly person. He very rarely got sick. Um, and he didn't get headaches often, uh, very, very seldom. So for the next two years of him working uh, at Crater of the Moon National Park, he is anticipating or stressing out about uh, a tourist going through Indian Tunnel or any other kind of lava tube that is accessible to the public and something happening to them. He'd periodically go um, to observe the tunnel and he had after that time, he had never seen anything else, uh, any kind of activity at Indian Tunnel. <clears throat> but, like I said, for, you know, the last two years of him working there, he really thought, hey, you know, there's going to be, you know, some family come out missing or someone's going to lose a child or something bad is going to happen. Uh Periodically, in certain areas of the National Park, he would catch some random strange lighting. Um, 
The park is open during the winter. There's very limited camping uh, there, RV camping and tent camping, but it's in very limited spaces. You, like you can't camp at the visiting center parking lot. There's just like, um, the last couple of strange anomalies he had seen, there was like a similar lighting, bluish white lighting in an area called ironically enough, blue dragon flow. Um, and close to a place called the Great Owl Cavern. And he had said that he had been in that area with another guy and another another park ranger. <clears throat> and it was getting to be about dusk. And it was roughly around that same time of year. Now, it gets cold out there at that time of year at night. It's you know, there's, it, it stays warm in the summer, you know, but in fall, it's not a pleasant place to be after the sun goes down. It's pretty chilly. Um, the sun was starting to set. They were, they had about a good half an hour to get back to where uh, their vehicles had been parked and um, they had noticed, the guy had noticed this like really bright light coming out of this great owl cavern. And he said to James, you know, someone's got a bright flashlight. Look at that shit. And instantly James said in his head, oh no, not again. You know, um, they walk over. And there's absolutely nothing there. The light was gone. They did. He didn't hear a rumble this time. But they both observed this bright, white, bluish light. And this light was more white than the blue. Um, and as I'm talking to Micah and documenting this, writing this stuff down, uh, James is, is there. I'm on speakerphone. Um, so he is uh, filling in some blanks. And, and like I said, after the aneurysms, his speech is not as great as, as it should be um, in his mobility. But his brain still functions great. He's still a very intelligent guy um, and can remember a lot. So the last experience that he had and it is the the experience that everyone including himself feels like the uh aneurysms stemmed from this experience was he was at a location and it was people were snowshoeing snow camping um, and there's drifts and there's, there's toilets out there for people to camp. Um, so he's, it's not too snowy, but it's, it's chilly and it's, you know, about six to seven inches of snow and it's called devil's orchard. And, um, he's out that way. There's a. Um, sidewalk area that you can walk and he's walking the sidewalk area um, a lot it's not shoveled it's not taken care of it's not cleaned or groomed in the winter all right this is not you know your run-of-the-mill national park um, he gets this really off feeling He's close to a weird kind of uh, lava structure. It, it juts up, and then it it's like a, a just a hole, and then a cave that goes in, and that's a lot of the bats 
uh, live in, in one of these lava flows. Um, but he gets this really strange, sick feeling. He's sick to his stomach. He's just got this like, God, I don't feel something's not right. And he's just finishing his rounds and he happens to look over and there's another kind of vaulted area that so you have that one tube that sticks up it's huge i mean i'm not like it's huge you, you could stand on the top and look in and you can see where the cave goes down in like that so you'd be at the top here and you look it goes in and it goes that way and that's all cave there's another opening that kind of juts like this and that connects to that area um, via lava tubes. And he sees this almost bright, kind of sickly green glow. And he hears this kind of like heartbeat noise. Um, the best way... James described it. Micah said it, it was kind of like a heartbeat, kind of like a, a thumping. And James, you know, agreed, yeah, like a thumping. Um, and what he saw was this light, and he's looking, and he's, he sees what he thought was it resembled like an alligator's tail going into this light. He didn't see a body. He didn't see anything other than this tail kind of just go into the light. The thumping was getting louder. It was like a heartbeat, boom, boom, boom. And when the tail disappeared into the light, the light kind of just pushed this just kind of whoosh. And it was gone. Instead of the light just dissipating into the cave, it just shot outward. And it kind of hit him. He felt it physically knock him back. He's on his way to um, end the day, make sure that all the registries and uh, monitor usage statistics are done, this and that. He is in his vehicle, and the last thing he remembers is having that happen getting to his vehicle, starting his vehicle up, and turning the heat on. He doesn't remember driving. He doesn't remember anything at that point. Um, from where he was parked, apparently he drove five miles and crashed his truck. That's when he had the first aneurysm, hospitalized, and then forced into retirement. And since that day, he has had three different aneurysms. And uh, after <clears throat> putting everything together and looking into all of this, uh, Micah was the one that really did a lot of research. His sister did as well, who we're not going to name um, she remains, Micah is his real name and James is his real name. The sister is going to remain anonymous just for her, her own well-being. Um, apparently, there was, and this kind of freaked me out. So at that EBR1, uh, Apparently, Jack Parsons and Zawicki had visited that uh, nuclear nuclear breeding reactor. Now, if you don't know who's who Parsons, Jack Parsons is, he created Aerojet. He was a occultist. Uh, he was worked or studied hand in hand with Crawley. Um, Zawicki 
I think Fritz Zwicky was a astronomer scientist. Now, this interestingly enough, when and this is all from Micah's research. Uh, interestingly enough, Parsons died in 52, 1952. He was 37 years old when he died. And if you remember what I said, the uh, EBR successfully started producing um, electricity electricity in December of 1951. Parsons visited this EBR one for no no apparent reason. Nobody knows why he was there. It's just uh, something that had been told to Micah prior to somewhere between 1949 and 1951. And if you know anything about Parsons, supposedly him and L. Ron Hubbard tried to summon demons. Um, a lot of those crazy scientific uh, government figures were into occult activity. Um, I just find it very, very strange that you've got a man who, with L. Ron Hubbard, very known, it's not a secret, tried to summon a demon. Now, he's visiting an area that is an experimental breeder, breeder reactor, one, <laughs> next to a 15,000 to 2,000 year old lava field with high obsidian and high activity of the paranormal portals, a giant, a Nephilim, some sort of reptilian tail. And then after he spots that reptilian tail, this green light just blows out instead of like that bluish white light where it just dissipated this light kind of just shot out of the cave like blew out that's very strange and very scary um and to me that shit's connected so with that i hope you enjoyed this as much as i enjoyed sharing it with you uh you know after i talked with micah i started to go through some older books that i have and pups seven uh and liz elizabeth sisney um both had blessed me with some amazing books. Well, uh, Pups gave me a bunch of Commander X, which is Bill Cooper books. And Elizabeth um, hit me off with some Stephen Quayle and some other really great, great books. But a lot of what, a lot of what James went through is so similar to things that I have read but at the end of it all your dad is near you know he survived four aneurysms which is a miracle in itself but at the end after he's retired and he's safe at home and this and that you find out that freaking Jack Parsons was there was at that EBR one. <sighs> That's how evil our government is. They are aware of these giants. They are aware of the dogmen. They are aware of the reptilian. 
That last thing that he saw was probably a Draco and some sort of just like maybe that green light was this whatever shuttle exhaust or whatever the hell he got hit with caused this damage to his brain. You know, it, it's just uh, his wife ended up dying of cancer and she was healthy prior to um so w what was he exposed to you know and strangely enough i did a little more research into this area um even though so even though these lava tubes and such um i had read this when i was trying to get the information about the park to share with you guys um even though they are not active, there is still hazardous air chemicals that are released. And, of course, um, there are some areas that say, while Craters of the Moon lies in one of the country's cleanest air regions, uh, many visitors... Many visitors do not see the clear vistas they expect. A haze, a haze often hangs in the air and much of this haze is not natural. They say it's air pollution. But yeah, it's the cleanest air quality. But you've got air pollution? That's not right. And also you cannot fly... You cannot use drones to take any kind of video or photographs in the park. Just something strange to think about. And there you have it, folks. I hope you all enjoyed this kind of little sneak in bonus just to get this Saturday going a little quicker until the live stream. I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. After all, it is your support that helps the channel to continue to grow and go. And honestly, what gets us and gives us a place to share our experiences and theories judgment-free. Everyone, please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, friends. These creatures are real. They are out there and dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the truth, and God bless.